Uh, so we're happy to welcome you today to our second webinar series from the Bex Working Group. And I am happy to introduce Dr. Chilin Wei. Chilin uh, received his Bachelor's of Science in Zoology from the National Chengxing University in Taiwan and then received both his master's and PhD at Texas A&M University. Um, it was in biological oceanography under the advisement of Dr. Gil Rowe. Dr. Wei uh, was a postdoctoral fellow with Memorial University of Newfoundland. And then since 2014 has been at the National Taiwan University where he is now an associate professor. Dr. Wei has participated in 37 research cruises and logged over 224 days at sea, which is quite impressive for a modeler like me. Um, so now you'll hear more about Dr. Wei's interests in community ecology, biodiversity, and benthic ecology. All right, so uh, it's my turn, I guess. All right, so um, today uh, I'd like to talk about uh, uh, some results uh, from paper that published by uh, some of my former postdoc and the student. So we talk. I will talk about how we link the basic community structure and the function uh, in the river connected and the high energy submarine canyon. Uh, but first, I want to thank uh, my lab member, the co-author, and the many colleagues and uh, also uh, the funding agency. So uh, this work are funded through uh, uh, the FATES, FATES project uh, sponsored by the National Science Technology Council uh, from Taiwan. So uh, what I'm gonna talk about uh, is submarine Kenyan. So uh, the worldwide, there are about 6,000 a large submarine canyon along the continental uh, margin. And the least canyon, they are major conduits of the sediment and the organic matter uh, to the deep sea. So uh, they also contribute significantly to habitat heterogeneity and the biodiversity on the continental margin. So most of these uh, canyons, uh, they are called the flying canyon about 70% of land, uh, they only incise the continental slope, uh, but they are less than 3% uh, actually connected to the shore and also uh, connected to river. So uh, despite uh, they are relatively uncommon, uh, this river canyon uh, can play a very important role in ocean's carbon cycling uh, because they can very effectively export the terrestrial organic carbon to the deep sea. Uh, however, uh, we know very little about land. So this is why I will bring your attention uh, to Taiwan, uh, this small island, uh, because we do have mainly a uh, river connected uh, summer in Kenya. Uh, but before I talk about the Kenya in Taiwan, I want to first talk about the plate tectonic of Taiwan. So uh, Taiwan's plate boundary is rather complex because it comprises of two uh, subduction zones of reverse polarity. So uh, uh, this is the island, but uh, this is north, is south. Uh, so to the, the northeast, uh, the convergence is caused by the northward subduction of Philippine Sea Plate underneath the Eurasia Plate. So this creates the Ryukyu Trench. And the, to the southwest, the convergence is caused by the eastward subduction of the Eurasia Plate underneath the Philippine Sea Plate. And this creates uh, the Benina Trench and the, the Central Mountain Range on the island. And uh, this subduction also creates numerous submarine canyons uh, around the southwest, the east, and the northeast. Uh, Taiwan. So about the Summering Canyon around Taiwan, uh, we have a total of about 13 large uh, Summering Canyons that occurred on the southwest, uh, the eastern, and the northeastern margin. 
uh, and we have about more than 50% of the canyon that are connected to river. And they export a tremendous amount of sediment uh, from Taiwan's high mountain into the deep sea. Uh, but today I would uh, focus on Gaoping submarine canyon of the Southwest Taiwan. So this Gaoping canyon start about one kilometer offshore and uh, connected to a small mountain river. Uh, this is called the Gaoping River. And the Gaoping River is originate uh, from Mount Jade of the Central Mountain Range at elevation more than 3000 meters above the sea level. So this Gulping River have very high sediment export. So it rank about the second highest in Taiwan, the export about 3.5 million tons of sediment per year. And even rank 11th highest in the world if uh, it divided by the drainage area. So uh, the bottom line is there's a lot of sediment coming from the mountain into the Gulping River, into the Gulping Canyon and the Expo to the deep sea, to the Molina Trench, toward the Philippines. So when we look at the high resolution bathymetric map of the Gulping Canyon, uh, it is very meander with many uh, sharp turns. So it is hypothesized that the gravity flow are causing and maintaining the sinuosity of the Gulping Canyon. Uh, for example, we can see large boulder. This is the evidence of the gravity flow or that can carry large boulder. We can also see the landslide uh, deposit, which is the evidence of slumping of the Kenyan wall. So all of these processes are causing and maintaining the Gulping submarine Kenyan. And in fact, the Gulping Canyon is best known for its turbidity and the gravity current. Uh, for example, uh, this is an aerial photo of the 2009 Typhoon uh, Morocco. So this image shows the turbidity current descending into the Gulping Canyon. So on average, you know, three to four typhoons may pass Taiwan per year from June to October. And from May, uh, to June, the monsoon also bring a lot of rainfall. So together uh, from May to October, typhoon and the monsoon can bring heavy precipitation and also bring sediment to trigger a uh, turbidity current uh, in the Gulping Canyon. Another less frequent uh, disturbance is the earthquake. Uh, for example, in 2006, there was a 7.0 magnitude underwater earthquake uh, struck offshore southwest Taiwan. Uh, so this figure shows the distance and the, the depth along the Gulping Canyon and the Malina Trench, where the debris flow triggered by the earthquake broke the telecommunication cable in sequence, uh, which the sequence is marked by the number. So based on the time of the breakage and the distance of the breakage, uh, we can calculate the speed of the debris flow. So the speed, the speed of this debris flow uh, was very fast. It's even over 70 kilometers per hour on the upper Gulf in Samarin, Kenya. So, uh, but whether it's turbidity or gravity current, uh, they are devastating to benthic community. Another less uh, devastating but long-term disturbance is the powerful internal tide in the Gulping Canyon. Uh, these internal tides are generated by tide moving across steep underwater ridge or underwater bank. And these two energy converge at the base of the Gulping Canyon and drive button intensified current along the axis of the canyon. Uh, the energy and the current velocity actually increase uh, toward the Kenyan head uh, because of progressively narrowing channel. And this internal tight current not only cause the sediment erosion, it also remove the fine sediment that usually contain higher organic carbon content. And this likely have long-term effect on the benthic community. <laughs> 
And when we measure uh, the delta C13 of organic carbon in the surface sediment and using a 2M member mixing model, we found that the Gaupin summary canyon is dominated by the terrestrial organic carbon. Uh, here we can see almost uh, 70 to 80 percent of organic carbon is uh, derived from the ter terrestrial environment. So this is also potential uh, food sources and uh, the terrestrial subsidy to the benthic community. So um, here, let's take a look some possible ecological response uh, to this unique uh, Kenyan condition. So we know that the ecological theory predict that uh, whether it's standing stock, the production or metabolism uh, should scale with available uh, resources. Uh, since the food supply in general uh, declined with water depths. So uh, we expect that the standing stock uh, should also uh, decline with increasing water depths. Uh, but a normal summer in Kenya uh, should, have higher stand, should have higher standing stock uh, due to the following and the accumulation effect of organic matter by this Kenya morphology. So with higher uh, food supply, the normal Kenyan should have a higher uh, biodiversity and can support a relative higher abundance uh, of larger size organism uh, if we plot uh, the abundance of organism by their body mass. Uh, the normal Kenyan should have more large size organism. However, uh, in a high energy and high disturbance Kenyan, like Gulfing Kenyan, uh, the standing stock and the diversity uh, may be depressed, and it will be especially depressed at the Kenyan head because the Kenyan head is subjected to the most severe disturbance. And also the abundance of the larger organism uh, should decrease more rapidly uh, than the small organism. Uh, this is because the larger organism that usually longer live, slower growth, and uh, so they are more vulnerable to disturbance. So this will produce a more negative slope or a steeper slope of this abundance uh, biomass uh, body size spectrum. So we want to see uh, whether this ecological prediction are correct. So we repeated sample the Gaupin summer in Kenyan and the adjacent upper slope four times over a year. Uh, we collect uh, macrofauna, myofauna, and uh, uh, bacteria with a, a multi-core uh, to study the benthic community structure. Uh, we also measure the sediment grain size, uh, total organic carbon, total nitrogen content from the sediment, and other environmental variable, including standard hydrographic parameter from the CTD row set and also the mean button current velocity and the duration of the sediment erosion uh, from an internal type uh, model. So specifically, we use the carbon and the nitrogen as proxy for sediment organic input uh, to indicate the food supply. And we use the button current velocity and the duration of sediment erosion as proxy of the internal type flushing in the Kenyan to indicate the physical disturbance. And we also measure uh, the sediment community oxygen consumption. Uh, we use the whole core sediment incubation to measure total oxygen utilization and the sediment micro profiling to measure the dissolved oxygen utilization. And we assume the difference represents the benzos oxygen utilization. So uh, here, uh, let's see whether the theory uh, predicts our observation. Uh, we found that uh, the macrofauna, which is left panel, and the myofauna, which is right panel, uh, their density was significantly lower uh, in the Kenyan, which indicate by red color, uh, compared to the adjacent slope, which is the blue color. And we also found that in the Kenyan, the macrofauna density was depressed at the head of the Kenyan. So this suggests that the Kenyan microfauna was subjected to severe a physical disturbance, which depressed the density near the Kenyan head and also the overall density along the entire Kenyan axis.
When we look at the microfaunal composition in terms of the polyky warmth, uh, so in this matrix, uh, the column shows the sample, uh, the row shows the polyky family, and the color, uh, the warmer color shows higher relative abundance. So we found distinctive compositional differences uh, between uh, the sample from the Kenyan uh, and the sample from the upper slope. We found much less family uh, in the Kenyan uh, compared to the slope. And there are many polyky family that thrive uh, on the slope, but become uh, locally extinct uh, in the Kenyan. So what's left in the Kenyan uh, is uh, Peranadei, uh, which is this guy, the Capitella Day is this guy, uh, Costura Day is this guy, and uh, uh, the Nesper Day uh, is this guy. Uh, this family are uh, motile subsurface deposit feeder. So that means they can burrow deep into the sediment and likely avoid the storm button current. Um, uh, this study shows the response of the biomass the size structure and the production of the respiration in the Kenyan uh, compared to the adjacent uh, slope. Uh, first, if we look at the biomass uh, body size uh, spectrum uh, for myofauna indicated by the empty symbol, macrofauna indicated by the solid symbol, and uh, the purple color shows the slope, orange color shows the Kenyan. Uh, we found that the slope uh, the purple color accumulate more biomass in every size classes. So this shows that the continental slope do have higher biomass uh, than the Gulf in Kenya. On the second plot, this is the normalized biomass size spectrum. Uh, so called the normalized biomass, this y-axis actually represents the relative abundance. And for myofauna, again, this is the empty symbol. The microfauna is the solid symbol. And the purple color shows the upper slope. Orange color shows the Kenyan. Uh, so we found that there are fewer larger size pencils uh, in the Kenyan. So the slope of this size spectra does become more negative or steeper uh, uh, in the Gulping Kenyan. And over here, this shows the secondary production, which is the growth of the myofauna on the left panel. And for microfauna on the right panel, uh, the color purple uh, still the slope, orange is still the Kenyan. So we found lower productivity in the Kenyan. Uh, when we look at uh, the respiration, uh, which is uh, the metabolism, we also found lower respiration in the Kenyan. Uh, so overall, we found that the Gulping Kenyan impact uh, the larger size uh, organism uh, more than the small size organism. Uh, which result in a uh, depressed biomass, depressed production, and a depressed uh, respiration uh, in the Kenyan. Uh, in another paper, we found that the nematode, uh, whether it's the species diversity, the functional diversity, trophic diversity, or maturity index, uh, significantly drop uh, in the Gulf in Kenyan, which are uh, indicated by this uh, dash a red dash light. And uh, we found that the non-selective passive feeding uh, face colonizing nematode species uh, dominate uh, the Kenyan. Uh, in contrast, uh, we found diverse feeding type, uh, including the non-selective deposit feeder, epigross feeder, omnivore, uh, predators that can coexist uh, on the uh, slope. And uh, uh, the nematode species composition was distinctively different uh, between the Kenyan and uh, the slope. And uh, the Kenyan assemblage is driven uh, by stronger internal tide, a uh, stronger sediment erosion, and the lower organic carbon content in the sediment. Uh, but the slope assemblage is driven by the lower internal tide energy and the higher organic carbon. Uh, in the sediment. So overall, we found that the disturbance from the internal tide, uh, from turbidity current or from the gravity current uh, can strongly uh, filter or shape basic community structure. <laughs>
okay, so next, uh, I want to talk about how we think uh, the community structure and the function to construct a carbon food web for the high energy Kenyan. So these are the results from uh, our new paper that's still in preparation uh, by my uh, student. Uh, but uh, anyway, we use the linear inverse model. Uh, we assuming steady state and the mass balancing among all these major organic carbon stock. And we also set up uh, the energy flow constraint. So we set up some constraint for this flow uh, with the minimum and then maximum value. Uh, these are from our field observation over from the literature value. And then we use the likelihood method to uh, solve uh, the foot wave model with many unknown uh, flow. So uh, we want to compare uh, the Kenyan head uh, versus the upper slope. Uh, but first, let's take a look at the organic carbon stock that used in the model, uh, that including the sediment organic carbon, uh, bacteria, myofauna, and the macrofauna. And we found, except for bacteria, uh, the organic carbon stock in the Kenyan are much lower uh, than the organic carbon stock on the slope. Uh, for example, the myofauna uh, in the Kenyan, the average about two milligram uh, carbon per square meter uh, on the slope is over 30. Uh, for macrofauna, the average in the Kenyan is about two. On the slope is close to 100. Uh, however, for the bacteria, uh, the organic carbon in the Kenyan uh, was significantly higher than the organic carbon uh, on, uh, in the slope. Uh, in terms of the sediment community oxygen consumption between the Kenyan head and upper slope, uh, very surprisingly, despite dramatic difference in community structure between the Kenyan and the slope, we found no differences between Kenyan and the slope. Uh, for total oxygen utilization, dissolved oxygen utilization, and also benzos oxygen utilization. So uh, here, uh, this figure summarizes uh, our food web model after the simulation. Uh, we found that the, uh, the Gulfing Kenyan head uh, received about 10 times more POC flux uh, than the upper slope. Uh, in the Gulfing Kenyan, it's about 1,200 uh, milligram carbon per square meter, and the on the slope is about 100. Uh, however, about 84% of this organic carbon flux exit the system as export, and about 14% spur in the sediment, and only 2% enter uh, the food web. And on the slope, about 74% uh, 74, 74 of organic carbon flux uh, was buried, and only 11% uh, exit the system. So that's mean about 15% uh, enter uh, the food web. And uh, uh, we also found if we look at the uh, biotic uh, carbon flow, which indicate by this uh, yellow arrow, uh, in the Kenyan, uh, the bacteria process dominate this uh, biotic carbon flow. Uh, but in, the contra in contrast, the upper slope food web uh, shows stronger interaction among the metazoan are uh, indicated by much higher flow uh, between the myofauna and the microfauna component. On the bottom uh, is the network index uh, uh, calculate from uh, the carbon food web. So the network index showed that the Kenyan head had higher uh, total system throw foot and the total system throw uh, flow, uh, indicating greater energy flowing through the system. Uh, in contrast, uh, the slope have higher uh, average mutual information and the thin cycling index, uh, suggesting a relative more mature ecosystem with higher energy recycling. So uh, here are some uh, short take home message. So we found that disturbance uh, from internal tide, from turbidity current or from gravity current uh, can strongly filter and shape fancy community in the high energy Kenyan. Uh, we also found that the community structure and the function were negatively impacted uh, by the uh, physical disturbance in the Gulfing Kenyan. Uh, but very surprisingly, uh, despite we found uh, a distinct difference in community structure 
or the sediment community oxygen consumption was not different between the Kenyang and the, the slope. And also, despite 10 times more uh, POC flux that entering the Gulf in Kenyang, about 84% exit the system, 14% is buried, about 2% enter the food web. And this result in greater energy flow through the system, uh, but less energy recycling within the Kenyang. And we also found that bacterial processes dominate the Gulf in Kenyang food web, and, but the metazoan interaction are stronger in the upper slope food web. So we think our result can provide a fundamental understanding of the deep sea ecosystem and also provide insight into the potential effect of climate change and human activity on the basic community structure and the function. All right, uh, thank you. I will take questions. Uh, see, I use about 25 minutes all, all my time. <laughs> I have a quick question, if uh, mm -hmm. if there's time. Um, I um, yeah. So thank you for a really interesting talk, and um, mm -hmm. and that there's lots of there's lots of fascinating ideas there. Um, so it's it's really interesting seeing that difference in in kind of faunal community biomass and um, and some of the functions between the canyon and the slope, but not other functions. That's really fascinating. Um, I was just wondering if so. It seems like one of the possibilities. Um, so you you you've considered the possibility of the physical disturbance impacting the faunal communities. I was just wondering if you had also considered the role of the different types of organic matter that they're being supplied, because you showed very clearly that there is a much higher influence of terrestrial organic matter in the canyon. Um, and have do you have any stable isotope data from the fauna? Do you know what they're eating? Do you know what they prefer to eat? And whether the difference in organic matter source is mm -hmm. um, potentially an explanatory factor as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh a short answer is uh, we don't have those data. Um, uh, despite um, I I like to have those data. Uh, so um, as you can see, our uh, we don't have any stable isotope data from for the fauna. Uh, we only have uh, the carbon thirteen for from the sediment. Um, um, it's most because logistical reason. Uh, we yeah. just cannot do so much for, for everything. So yeah, uh, definitely we need to know more about the uh, uh, different type of organic matter uh, from sediment and also more evidence uh, from the fauna. Yeah, so yeah, it was very small, uh, small group. <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much. As I say, really fascinating results, so yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Chilin. Mm -hmm. Should we move on? I think uh, let's move on to our second speaker. And mm -hmm. if there's additional questions for Chilin, we can take that at the end. Yeah, sure. Let me go. Sure. Okay. I'll uh, I'll get my my slides. Ready. Okay. While you're doing that, I'll just okay. introduce our introduce you. So uh, Dr. Claire Wolds is a professor of marine biogeochemistry at the University of Leeds. Her research broadly focuses on benthic biogeochemical processes with particular focus on the role of benthic fauna in shaping their uh, geochemical environment. Um, so Dr. Wolds uses a combination of stable isotope tracers and manipulative, manipulative experiments to study the effects of various stressors on benthic community function and biogeochemical cycling. She's done a lot of work in uh, low oxygen environments and understanding various factors um, driving uh, community function and a uh, fate of organic matter in the sediments. So today she'll be talking to us about carbon cycling by benthic communities. So take it away. Thank you very much, Jessica, and thank you indeed for the um, invitation to, to speak today. Um, it's much appreciated. Um, so I'm going to um, do a bit of a of a kind of whiz through a whole load of different work looking at the role of fauna in uh, oh, fauna, a fauna and, and wider kind of biological communities in carbon cycling um, in different benthic environments. Um, so we're just going to start off by um, 
looking at some rationale. So why are we interested in the, in the role of fauna in, in seafloor carbon cycling? So what we have here is one of the, the kind of um, popular pictures of, of, the, um, of the carbon cycle. And we can see lots of carbon being cycled between surface reactive reservoirs, all of which can exchange with the atmosphere. And then we can see at the bottom, I don't know, can you see my pointer or not see my pointer? You can. OK, excellent. So we can see at the bottom here um, one fairly small flux of carbon um, being buried in seafloor sediments. And this is, uh, although it's a small, slow flux, it's an important flux because it is uh, one of the return mechanisms for carbon into the geological loop of the carbon cycle. So we're interested in understanding that flux. Um, if we look over on the right hand side of the slide, if we go to you know, lots of different places in, in, uh, in the ocean and look at total organic carbon concentration down core, we see a loss of carbon down core as the sediment ages. Um, um, and so it's important for us to understand the processes that um, that go into that loss of carbon down core. And of course, the thing that um, there's lots of work on the kind of abiotic controls on different things like grain size and oxygen and sedimentation rate and chemical or min mineral mineralogical mechanisms. Um, but we also need to remember that that um, that loss of carbon happens also partly through um, cycling through an entire benthic ecosystem. Um, and those biological processes and faunal activity are often one of the less well constrained aspects of what's going on. The other thing that we should remember um, and which uh, Chilin touched on is that um, this input of carbon to the seafloor is also nutrition for um, that seafloor ecosystem. So we can kind of turn around and look at it from the other perspective and say we're interested on, uh, in how seafloor um, ecosystems are, are, are nourished and sustained. OK, um, carbon in seafloor sediments has recently become much more um, interesting in terms of for, for, for governments and policymakers. Um, we have uh, an example here of some facts and a figure from from um, a, a recent U, uh, report based out of the UK. Um, which is kind of motivated by the fact that there's more and more awareness that shell, uh, that sea that, that, that sea water and also sediments um, absorb and store quite a lot of carbon each year. Um, this report in particular was on UK shelf seas, um, but there's a lot of uncertainty as to how long carbon is stored for. Um, what do we actually mean by burial? How long does carbon have to stay in the sediment in order to count as buried? Um, and the reason that governments and uh, management organisations are uh, increasingly interested is the fact that um, storage of carbon is considered natural capital, has the potential to be um, used in, in offsetting or traded. Um, but for those kinds of uses to be well founded, we have to know how much carbon is being added to these systems, how long is it stored for, and um, how might those things change as our environment changes. Um, so let's, um, staying with the same figure, let's come on to thinking about what kind of roles the seafloor ecosystems have in this carbon storage um, and, and processing. And we can see um, in our little cartoon here, this, it sets out quite well what might happen to carbon when it arrives at the seafloor. And there are different processes that, that faunal communities and that biological communities as a whole might be involved in. Um, and Chilin has um, referred to some of these already. So we have uh, respiration, the organisms living in the sediment might be, be a key um, uh, might turn some of that carbon back into CO2 and release it back into the seawater. Um, we have the irrigation of sediment and introduction of, of um, respiratory electron acceptors by bioirrigation, so pumping of seawater through the sediment. And we have physical mixing of the sediment in bioturbation, which might um, bury carbon more quickly or might, um, might exhume carbon, which has already been, uh, quote, buried uh, to some depth. And then the, the organisms living in the sediment uh, also tend to ingest and digest sediment. So they'll bring about some kind of geochemical change. Um, uh, and finally, all of those activities will also have an impact on uh, the microbial community living in the sediment. And um, usually that's in the direction of stimulating microbial activity. So there are lots of different ways that fauna living in the sediment can impact on sediment carbon cycling and storage. Um, so the way that I have tended to um, approach this problem over the years is using an isotope tracer experiments. Um, so this is where we add 
uh, an organic carbon source, which is labeled with the stable isotope carbon-13. Um, and we add that to the sediment and then incubate the sediment under natural or, or manipulated conditions for, for a few days or a few weeks. And we can see where the carbon-13 label has gone. So has it turned into dissolved inorganic carbon? So been, been processed through respiration, how much of it still resides in the sediment, and then how much has been taken up by different types of fauna and through um, biomarkers through into the bacteria as well. And I've been lucky enough to do these kinds of experiments using a range of technology from a pair of uh, rubber boots um, out on the sand flat or the mud flats um, all the way through to recovered cores and various in situ technology. Um, so I'm going to start um, with a kind of summary of previous literature and I'm going to um, I'm going to I just want to clarify the 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 processes that I'm going to classify as biological carbon processing um, include respiration of carbon, um, uptake of carbon by bacteria and uptake of carbon by different faunal groups. So the, all of those together, kind of summed together, I will consider biological carbon processing. Uh, and I'm going to think first of all about the distribution of the processed carbon between those different biological processes. Um, and so this is going back a little way now. I, I took some of my own experiments and I put them alongside um, results generated by various other groups in a range of different environments. And um, what became clear is that if you if you plot out these pie charts of the distribution of carbon amongst the different biological processes, you get some kind of visually similar patterns emerging. Uh, and on the basis of that, um, I proposed a a classification of different um, patterns of organic carbon processing at the seafloor. So if we go to deep, um, relatively organic pore sites with um, with that, that kind of lower biomass that tends to go with that, we tend to find that biological carbon processing is dominated by respiration. If we come into shallower sites with more organic matter input, um, we find that the role for, of uptake by fauna, and so the routing of carbon through the faunal pool um, tends to increase um, and the identity of those fauna um, is then influenced by different things so and, and oxygen being the one that has kind of come to my notice most. But now there, there are some sites which I think have particularly high organic matter input or particularly high biomass macrofaunal communities for, for different reasons where we find actually that um, an unexpectedly high proportion of organic carbon that arrives at the seafloor actually gets rooted through the macrofaunal community. Um, so this has been observed at um, OMZ boundaries where you get this um, kind of edge effect, a, a, a boom in biomass of, of different fauna. I have also seen this in a like in a, a coastal fjord environment again where you get this high organic matter input and, and a high biomass community to go with it. Uh, and then interestingly, if you look at permeable sediments, so sands instead of muds, um, there's a couple of examples, one, one of my experiments and one by an, a different group, um, we find that bacterial uptake of carbon is particularly interesting and this uh, particularly important rather, and this is consistent with those sediments um, having a, an unexpectedly high carbon turnover um, fueled by rapid um, supply of organic matter and of um, electron acceptors by, by this kind of um, advection of pore water. Okay, so if we if we move on and, and think um, about what governs the uptake of carbon, particularly by fauna, I think the, fir the first place to start is that we tend to see correlation between the biomass of the organisms in the experiment and um, the amount of carbon, carbon that they take up. Um, so you can see this for a range of Arabian Sea fauna here. We can see that some fauna, the, the closed black circles there, lie slightly above the line, um, and that tends to... Um, indicate fauna which are particularly voracious feeders on, on the added organic carbon. And I was just, just a note at the bottom there, this has been um, this has been seen in other studies as well. The most recent one um, uh, uh, in, in a Nor Norwegian fjord looking at for, for a maniferal uptake of carbon um, also being dictated by which taxa are, are dominantly present. 
Um, but when we start, the, when when we um, look a bit more into this, we can see some interesting impacts of low oxygen environments. So these data come from um, experiments at one particular site in the Arabian oxygen, uh, Arabian Sea oxygen minimum zone um, from 2003, and we had a, a kind of unexpected but quite fortuitous natural experiment conducted for us in that we went to this site before the um, summer monsoon and found that. Um, of the fauna there, the macrofauna were responsible for most of the uptake of organic matter. That's what we get at this on this left hand side. When the site was oxic, we get most of the uh, organic matter uptake being carried out by macrofauna. When we went back after the summer monsoon and the oxygen minimum zone had shoaled, so this same site with its same faunal community had become hypoxic. And um, the macrofauna were then uh, much reduced their organic carbon uptake and that resource was instead um, kind of capitalized on by foraminifera and by bacteria um, who were able to deal with the reduced oxygen concentration much better. Um, and so this has implications for um, changes we might see if the routing through of carbon through faunal communities, if we see um, spreading coastal hypoxia, for example, as a result of um, climate warming. So when we went back to the Arabian Sea, we decided to test this by deliberately manipulating oxygen. So we have these up, um, upwards and downwards manipulations of oxygen at three different sites. So um, one very low oxygen site where oxygen was only just detectable, and then two um, sites with increasing but still very low levels of oxygen. And these are total um, total uh, sorry respiration of of the added carbon. Um, under those different oxygen conditions. So we can see at the very lowest oxygen site, when we add oxygen, we stimulate additional respiration of the added carbon. But at the other two sites where there is some oxygen present, if you add oxygen or if you take a bit of oxygen away, um, there was not necessarily a measurable difference in respiration of, um, of carbon. Perhaps if you're gonna say anything, you're gonna say that that the amount of respiration has decreased. So it seems like these communities are quite well adapted to their, um, to their ambient oxygen concentrations. If we look um, at the uptake of carbon by bacteria in this same experiment, we can see that again, at the lowest oxygen site, when we add oxygen, we do get increased uptake of carbon by bacteria. Uh, we seem to maybe get some um, uptake um, by bacteria when we manipulate oxygen at other sites. There aren't error bars on these um, diagrams. Those error bars are likely to be fairly sizable, but you know, again, we're probably seeing quite a lot of resilience in the um, in the pattern of carbon cycling at these sites when we manipulate oxygen. When we look at the amount of carbon taken up by the fauna, um, there is a bit more of a of a um, of an effect, uh, especially of increasing oxygen, not at the lowest oxygen site. The 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 fauna there responsible for the carbon uptake are almost entirely um, take up by foraminifera, um, and when we add oxygen at that site, we don't really see an increase in in carbon uptake. Um, but when we go to the sites which do have oxygen present, we can see that if we take oxygen away, the fauna are less able to um, to utilize the food source that we add. Uh, if we add oxygen, we get an increase in faunal uptake of carbon. Um, and interestingly, at the at the at the lower oxygen site, um, 814 meters, it's the foraminifera that can respond and make use of that extra oxygen and take up more carbon. And when we go to the slightly more oxygenated site, it's the macrofauna that can increase their amount of carbon uptake um, when we give them a bit more oxygen. So we're seeing um, that the fauna can respond to more oxygen availability um, and the, the, the identities of the fauna that responds is, is uh, dependent on the kind of starting conditions. Larger organisms need more oxygen to function. Um, but overall, if we look at the total amount of carbon processed by the biological community, and now we do have error bars on the, on the diagram, at the very lowest oxygen site, we can see that adding oxygen stimulates carbon cycling, but at the sites where oxygen was already present, if we add oxygen or take it away, we don't see 
um, really significant change in the amount of biological carbon processing. So again, these um, communities are quite well adapted to their um, to their natural um, oxygen conditions, um, and they have some resilience to to the change in in oxygen availability. OK, so moving away from oxygen, which is one of the um, oxygenation is one of the things might, that might change as, as climate um, changes and as environment changes. Um, I'm going to move through a few other um, things that might be impacted um, through through global warming. Um, this is a, a warming experiment that uh, a PhD student, a previous PhD student of mine conducted, um, and she uh, this is sediment community oxygen consumption data from three different temperature treatments. So she had an ambient in, in uh, green, a, a plus three degrees in, in the kind of amber, and then a plus, uh, well, I guess what's that, plus seven degrees in, uh, in the red, which is reflective of a kind of summer heat wave extreme event. Um, and she saw that at, at that most extreme treatment, she did see an increase in sediment community oxygen consumption. And as when she did, uh, the, as Chilin um, explained earlier, looking at the difference between the incubation result and the sediment um, oxygen profile result, um, she could attribute that intra increase in oxygen consumption to um, increased oxygen consumption by the fauna in response to warming. So that that would be interpreted as a stress response. And um, just to pick up some work from other groups, which is um, also kind of speaks to things that could change in the future. So this isn't work that I've been involved in, but um, I'd like to point out that another expected change with environmental changes, um, different phytoplankton communities. So we can see um, on the left here that we have um, uh, reduced uptake and processing of ice algae compared to phytoplankton. So we might expect that if we get less sea ice and more phytoplankton, we'd we'd see more processing of the carbon that lands at the sea floor. Um, and on the right, we see that uh, in the longer experiment, not necessarily in the four day experiment, but in this 14 day version of this experiment, um, we see quite a lot more uptake and processing of the diatom carbon compared to a similar experiment with coccolithophorid carbon. Um, so again, if we get changes in phytoplankton communities, that's likely to have knock-on effects on how much carbon is cycled and processed through benthic communities. But it's not necessarily um, possible to predict exactly what, what the, the result then is for carbon storage. Um, the other impact of, of global change that we might expect to see or that we are seeing rather is acidification of the ocean. So this experiment, again, by a, a group that, that I'm not involved in, was looking at um, carbon uptake by fauna under elevated CO2 as well as under hypoxia. And we can see that under elevated CO2, the amount of carbon that the fauna took up um, increased and this was interpreted also as a stress response so providing the fauna with the with the kind of metabolic fuel that they need to deal with the stress of the elevated co2 when that was then combined also with hypoxia i've lost my pointer um faunal carbon uptake really collapsed so they could cope with the one stressor but not two stressors at once um, and when in this elevated co2 and hypoxic um circumstance they then also saw um, quite a lot more storage of carbon in the sediment because it wasn't being cycled through the fauna. Okay, I'm looking. I'm seeing that I'm uh, I'm running low on time, but I've I've got one more experiment to um, to talk through. So this is returning to the topic of sediment respiration. So as we saw earlier, um, respiration is often a dominant fate of biologically processed carbon. And so what it, I wanted to do with this experiment was try and um, pick apart what is kind of a, a black box of you know who who is doing the respiration which which parts of the faunal community are responsible for respiration so this was a, a microcosm experiment with constructed microcosms so we had um, four treatments um a control treatment which was intact sediment cores um a defaunated treatment where we'd used uh, hypoxia to to basically to remove the the macro fauna uh, a restocked treatment where we'd remove the macrofauna, then put in a controlled community um, and a fauna, fauna only 
treatment, which was constructed with uh, builder's sand, which with, with the fauna added in. And I should mention, this is a collaboration with um, Dick Van Overlen in uh, uh, at NEOS and Philip Maisman, who was at NEOS now at, um, uh, it's on my final slide, sorry, in Belgium, Antwerp, that's right. Uh, and their student, Dr. Silvio Hidalgo Martinez. Um, so we can have a look at some um, results from this experiment. Oh, sorry, those are the, this is the kind of typical intertidal fauna community that was that was added back in, um, and we measured respiration in this experiment both as oxygen uptake by the total community and also as um, production of labelled dissolved inorganic carbon. Um, uh, through. through it, it, uh, in the normal kind of isotope tracing experiment method and we can the the interesting thing i'd like to point out from this slide is that when we look at the defaunated treatment so this is microbial community only and the fauna treatment so this is macrofauna only we see very similar amounts of respiration accounted for by those two portions of the faunal community. And that's whether we're looking at total oxygen uptake or whether we're looking at generation of labeled dissolved inorganic carbon. Um, and this kind of, I mean, perhaps it's less surprising for an intertidal community, but um, we do tend to make the assumption that the lion's share of the respiration is accounted for by the microbial community. Um, and this result very much suggests that um, the macrofauna are um, in this case equally important. Um, if we then move on to looking at bacterial uptake, um, the interesting result here is that we have um, more uptake of carbon by the bacteria in the treatment that was defaunated. So when the macrofauna were not present and not um, not providing either competition to the to the microbial community and not providing kind of grazing pressure, we see much more uptake of carbon by the by the bacteria or by the by the microbial community. Um, and so I think this is best interpreted as um, competition for that food resource between the microbial community and the and the macrofauna community and although competition is something that gets thought about actually competition between kingdoms is not something that is often considered and you'll you'll see um there's uh, another mention of this in the publications by hunter et al oh didn't mean to click on there we go um another way of thinking about this however is that there is some kind of functional redundancy in these um, communities so that um, if you take out one element of the community, then that function is, is kind of replaced by another element. Uh, and that's a, a pattern that has also been seen in the, in the Rossi um, uh, study that, that I referenced there. Okay, so this is final slide. I think we're just about um, making it into time. Um, the final point I'd like to make is that um, if you take the the oxygen uptake measured in the defaunated uh, treatment and add it to the oxygen uptake measured in the treatment with just fauna. So if you add the just microbes respiration and the just fauna respiration, you tend to come to a lower amount, uh, especially in, in this particular, this experiment was run twice. So in this version of the experiment, when you add just the fauna on their own together with just the micro microbes on their own, you get a lower amount of oxygen uptake than, than when you measure the restocked treatment, which was both of those together. Sorry, I don't know where my point has gone. We get we get more oxygen uptake measured when we when we've got the fauna and the microbes present together. Um, and this is um this supports the suggestion that Jack Middleberg made in 2018 for an inverted microbial loop where um, the presence of fauna is stimulating the activity of microbes. And so we get more respiration overall when we've got those two groups present together. This, of course, um, is very much in line with discussions that have been had about um, priming 
and the way that microbial communities can be stimulated and primed um, by supplying, by being supplied with organic carbon by macrofaunal activity, whether that's through kind of burrow lining secretions or through biotubation and introduction of um, that resource to depth, or just, just the fact that biotubation spreads the food resource through spatially through the sediment um, in a way that makes it available to microbes where it's not available just from having been deposited on the surface. It's not available to the whole community just by being deposited on the surface. So this is probably a, a topic that requires a little bit more um, research. Okay, so just um, I think my if I was through the summary points, so um, there's a, a range of different processes by which um, fauna can influence carbon cycling. Um, community structure is often an important driving force um, with oxygen concentration sometimes playing a role in which which parts of the community are most active in carbon cycling. Um, we've there's er experimental evidence out there for the influence that things like warming CO2 and changing phytoplankton communities are going to have on on biological carbon processing. But there's not that much. I mean, there's, there's quite a lot more room for for more work on all of those factors. Um, and then the the respiration experiment that I've been discussing shows us evidence for competition between kingdoms for a certain amount of resilience or functional redundancy in for in benthic communities uh, and for uh, an inverted microbial loop and and priming. So all of these can, can be the subject of further research. Okay, um, I'm going to put up a list of acknowledgements of collaborators there, um, and ask if there's any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Uh, would you like to ask it or do you want me to read it? Han, Han Ying? Okay. Um, uh, um, this person says, I have a question for Dr. Wolds. If you add uh, 13C organic carbon into incubations, have you considered the remineralization of 13C organic carbon following by following by 13C inorganic carbon fixation from chemosynthesis and production of organic that, matter? That's a really good question. Um, and I think it's something that we increasingly need to consider um, because there is growing evidence for inorganic carbon fixation in a whole range of benthic environments that are not traditionally thought to be chemosynthetic environments. Um, so, uh, I guess the short answer is no, I haven't thought about it in the design of most of these experiments. Um, what I have done is carried out um, inorganic carbon additions, um, uh, in my case, in, uh, in the Southern Ocean, so in the Bransfield Strait and on the South Georgia margin, um, and we did measure fixation of inorganic carbon into organic matter, um, both at site a site that was influenced by hydrothermal fluids but also at a site that wasn't influenced by hydrothermal fluids and also at methane rich sites on on the south georgia margin um andrew sweetman's group has measured this process in um on the abyssal plain again at completely non not uh sites that were traditionally thought of as being chemosynthetic so um yes i think this is a really important process that requires further um, investigation, further quantification. Thanks. Any other questions? It's a new message in the chat. Okay, thank you. Um, I I was wondering, so this is fascinating, Claire. I, I know this is a little over time, but maybe okay. <laughs> around another question or two. Uh, this is very interesting. And I'm wondering if you have, um, so you didn't show uh, kind of the time response. And I'm wondering if there's a time scale response um, to the resiliency um, of, you know, bacteria dominated or faunal dominated communities. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question as well. Um, I think the short answer is that I haven't done long enough experiments to test that. Um, because I think those kinds of experiments would need to be done in situ. Um, and in a way where you could go back and revisit a, a plot um, uh, after a certain amount of time. So 
the technology does exist. I think you'd need to look at, so Ursula Vita um, published a quite a long experiment from the porcupine abyssal plane. Um, and I think you do see, over time, you do see a decrease in the importance of uptake by fauna in favor of more uptake by, um, by bacteria. Um, I suppose you'd have to ask whether some, some of that is to do with, um, to do with the resource partitioning um, that there's some work by Van Noteren from 2009, um, which points out that the macrofauna can access organic carbon as soon as it's added at the sediment surface. You know, a lot of them are motile and they can just get it straight away. And a lot of the microbial community rely on bioturbation to happen before they have access to the resource. Um, and so, yes, I think that probably is a large part of the explanation why you get more uptake by macrofauna, and I guess potentially some of the mayofauna initially, um, and then that will the balance will sway in favour of of microbes uh, as time goes on. And yeah, what the really long term picture is, I think. I mean, I'd have to go back to the literature, but there are not that many very long experiments out there. Um, when you're working in microcosms, you just can't keep them alive for long enough uh, to, to do that. <laughs> um, that's, the, that's the problem. Yeah, because in some sense, um, the results that Chilin showed earlier is a time scale question, is the um, both the frequency and the timing of the dis, um, disturbance, uh, or the frequency and the amount of the disturbance, sorry. Um, so uh, with, I guess, um, yeah, there are like there's some very interesting connections here with the two. two yeah. yeah, yeah, really interesting connections. And you're right that that when when you start looking at different sites that are experiencing different conditions, then yeah, you're looking at the proper long term um, impacts, which also, of course, involve um, change to community structure. So you have the organisms living there that can you know that that uh, thrive in those conditions or are adapted to those conditions so um if you're going to manipulate if you're going to yeah you have to decide what you're going to do are you going to say i just want one community and i'm going to test its response to different conditions or am i going to allow for the and 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 i have to have the caveat then that in my experiment the faunal community can't change and that is a limitation of, of that kind of experimental approach. Or am I going to have that, um, you know, use a kind of natural laboratory type setup and accept the fact that my different sites have different community structure? Right. Um, so, yeah, you, the, the, there are there are pros and cons. And perhaps the best thing is to put both approaches together. Yeah. Um, great. Um, any other questions? From this group? All right. Um, if not, then um, let's thank our speakers again. Um, thank you. These are really fascinating two different but highly complimentary talks on a similar topic. Um, and yeah, so we'll be um, doing another BEX webinar in two months, um, date and topic to be um, announced. And um, yeah, just stay tuned um, on our website and, um, and the email uh, thread. So um, thank you again to our speakers. Thank you very much for having us. Yeah. Yeah. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye.